Good morning. I'll wait a second as everybody starts flowing back in. Good morning. Welcome to the, our general session on transportation innovation and through innovation and data analytics. I'm Pat Malamphy, a member of the North Carolina Department of Transportation Board. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to remind you to stay engaged with our speakers, exhibitors, and social commentary throughout the summit by using our app that hopefully you have downloaded. It's the Crowd Compass Attendee Hub app, and our event can be located by searching 2022 North Carolina Transportation Summit. By actively using the Summit app, you have a chance to win a North Carolina-inspired gift basket. In the app, click the icon that says Game. See what tasks you need to complete to earn points, compare your progress to other attendees, and potentially go home a winner. To kick things off, please take a moment to answer the question we will discuss. Uh, we will talk, discuss the answers later in the session. So go to your app, you have to click on schedule, and then pull down or scroll down to poll. And the question is, how is data analytics changing the transportation industry? Uh, first answer, potential answer is transportation agencies can gain insight on projects. Number two, transportation agencies can forecast incidents such as traffic and accidents. Number three is identify impacts of projects or project alternatives. And the last question or last answer is all of the above. We will also take questions from the audience for our panelists at the end of the session. On social media, use the hashtag PoundNC Transportation Summit. Using data can make any business more efficient. Today, we are going to hear from two experts about how data can have the same impact on transportation. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, please welcome Manali Shah. Manali is a business executive, public sector for Google. In her current role, she drives the creation of smart cities and mobility solutions that address the needs of the public sector and public sector agencies. Please join me in welcoming Manali Shah. Department of Transportation and the Commission for inviting me to speak here. Really excited to be here in person. My daughter was particularly excited when she heard I was coming to North Carolina because she loves the show Outer Banks. I'm like, I'm not going to Outer Banks, but she was excited that I was coming here. So we heard today from the governor, the commissioner, um, secretary, and this is a really exciting time in transportation. There are so many opportunities for us with new funding coming in, new and existing challenges, and so much innovation happening in this space. And so what I like to do is step back and think about when we think of this concept of data to delivery, what does delivery mean? It could mean a lot of different things. It could mean delivering infrastructure projects, it could mean delivering safer travel experiences. It could mean delivering timely and relevant information to maintenance teams, traffic operations. It could also mean finding new ways to connect people to opportunities, and especially those who have been left behind. It could mean connecting with each other. We know we all crave more of that connection and have had to find new ways to do that during the pandemic. And it could also mean growing our own skills and experiences for the challenges that are coming next. So I like to stop and think about what's the mission, what's the impact that we want to make, big or small. So I'd ask each of you to think for a moment, you know, if you have something to write it down, I don't, I don't see a lot of notebooks out there, but maybe just mental notes or on your phone. Take a moment and think about for yourself, what's something that you're passionate about and what's your mission? What's the impact that you want to drive? Take a moment to think about that. 
And later, we'd like to hear some of those ideas. I'll ask you, maybe with a show of hands, how many people had an idea that came right away to your mind when you thought about the impact or the mission that you want to drive? Anyone? Okay, a few people. Um, how many people had an idea that came to their mind, but then thought about all the barriers of, of, and the obstacles and thought, oh, that's not going to work? Anyone? How many people are like, hey, I'm still waking up. I haven't had enough coffee yet. <laughs> well, hopefully we are going to inspire you with ideas and start those juices flowing. And I think what's exciting, you know, as you sit here um, over the next couple of days, opening up your minds and engaging in these sessions and listen for what inspires you. Follow the spark and pay attention to that. What sparks you? What sparks your ideas? What impact do you want to drive in whatever corner of the world you're in? And for me, you know, when I think about it, I started off my career as a civil environmental engineer. Um, and I took a very non-traditional path. And somehow I ended up in this world of data analytics, machine learning, AI. You know, when I started off my career, I didn't, I'd never heard of these words. I didn't know what any of them even meant. And I say that just to kind of help us all free our minds of the constraints that we put on ourselves about what's possible. And as engineers, we often like to kind of know the path and know how to get things done. And so as you think about the next couple of days, I encourage you to open up your minds and I really believe that the possibilities are, are endless and limitless. And it's really about us opening up our hearts and our minds. And then the ways that we get things done will come to us and the resources and the opportunities. There's so much to tap into with the resources that are in this room and beyond. So let's take this moment to really Think about the impact we want to make in transportation and take advantage of this opportunity. So with that, I'll start with, you know, as, when you think about Google, you know, what is the mission of Google? As we think about it, it's really organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. And that sounds simple. And, but behind the scenes, there's a lot of complexity, right? We're sensing the world around us, bringing together lots of data, using cloud computing, machine learning, all these technologies to enable these experiences for us as users to be simple and easy. So we think about this in the mindset that we operate with is what we call this 10x mindset of really thinking about what challenges are there and how do we make ourselves approach them in bigger ways? And we call that this 10x mindset. So when we think about some of the things that we do as a company, you might think of things like search or assistant, these things that we use as consumers, these tools that enable us to access information about the world. And we don't think as consumers, we don't think about all the technology and all that that's happening behind the scenes. We just Think about what do we need in a very simple way and delivering that information to us in a way that's relevant and simple. And I think about this, you know, as, as I help my kids sometimes, you know, with math, um, even after years of math and calculus, I forget how to do some of these things. And I'll go in and do a search on, you know, the quadratic formula. And what will come back to me is the formulas, how to solve these problems, examples, and it's all delivered to me in a way that's really simple and easy for me to understand and consume. And so that's really the power of using technology is delivering that experience in a really simple way. And I'm working with my kids, and I see how simple it is to get this information. I also wonder, well, if I could look it up that quickly, why aren't you doing that? But that's, that's another conversation. So we're also sensing the world around us, the physical environment. And if you think of things like Google Maps, 
we have cameras and imagery and all these sensors that are detecting things about the physical environment. And then we are taking all that information and translating that into Google Maps to give guidance to people. We're bringing in other modes of transportation like transit, walking, biking, ride hailing, scooters, all these new modes of transportation. And we are bringing that to the user in a way that is timely, contextually relevant, and simple for them to make choices and understand what their options are. But behind the scenes, there's all the interpretation and um, technology, but again, for the user, it's a simple experience. So when we think about this world of the traveler, we're really transforming the experiences from a traveler perspective. So you can think about in the vehicle, things like Android Auto, on our mobile devices, Waze, Google Maps, and then the next generation of technologies with Waymo, self-driving vehicles. And when you think about these different technologies, what's common about them is that they are all software-enabled experiences. And that's the transformation that is happening in our sector. We are delivering these experiences and transforming what the traveler is able to access, understand, and make choices about. So a lot of our focus has been on the consumer and the traveler. So all those technologies that we use to build these experiences for our own products, we're now taking those and making those much more accessible through our cloud computing and technologies, machine learning, AI, all these technologies that we've been using in our own products, we've brought those out into the Google Cloud platform. And so we're really looking now at how do we help agencies transform experiences? And not just for the traveler, but for those who are operating mobility services, who are managing the infrastructure, bringing information in a way that's simple, easy to understand, and gets you relevant information to be able to make decisions, planning decisions, operational decisions, and get the insight that helps you all make decisions for your own jobs. And so what we're gonna do today is really talk about that side of it and bringing these tools and technologies to you who are managing and operating the infrastructure and mobility services. So I'll start with this concept of digital transformation and the journey of digital transformation. And you may have heard of this term, you know, and why does it really matter? Why do we care about transforming our organizations and using technology to do this? Well, one, being complacent and failure to innovate the fundamental risk is irrelevance, and many companies face that challenge. If you're not innovating, you become irrelevant because somebody else is innovating at a faster pace. And what's, what's powerful now is that the technology is one of the enablers to make innovation happen faster, easier, and in a more, less costly way. So technology is just the enabler, and it's a key enabler to innovation. There's definitely more factors than the technology, but that's one key enabler. So as you think about this journey of digital transformation, I like to think about it in kind of this four main principles. First is starting with the outcomes. What are the desired outcomes? And that comes back to the mission. What is it that you, what's the challenge you wanna solve? Is it making the roads safer? Is it being able to detect incidents faster and respond to them? What are those outcomes that you really care about? And that maybe you have part of the answer, but not all of the answer, and you wanna get it to the next level. So starting with what are the desired outcomes? The second part of it is thinking about collecting what's relevant from a data perspective. We're not looking at like, let's collect all the data. Let's really look at what do we need to be able to deliver the outcome and collecting what's relevant? And what we find often is that a lot of the data is already there. It's just we need to turn that data into insight. 
And sometimes there's a need to augment with new data sources. But it's all in the service of that outcome. So being able to take all this data and turn it into insight to help people make decisions, whether it's a planning decision, an investment decision, an operational decision, what's the insights that, that is needed to make a decision? And then the last part is empowering an ecosystem. And that ecosystem could be stakeholders within your own agency. It could be between different agencies, between different levels of government, between companies. So it's being able to empower lots of users, not just have it be certain experts who have access to the information that in technology, but really empowering the ecosystem to unleash the potential. So what I'll do now is just go through a few quick examples to jar some of the ideas and thoughts. The first one I'd like to share with you, I was in um, Germany for ITS World Congress in October, and one of the things that the city of Hamburg wanted to do is they wanted to understand air pollution and emission patterns across their city to look at urban planning decisions. And so we had our street view vehicles that have all these cameras on them and you know collect data around building maps. We added air quality sensors to these vehicles to understand and collect data around emissions and air quality. And that data then was combined with traffic patterns, travel patterns, looking at trips across the city to understand different patterns and related to air quality, emissions, and travel patterns. And this is information that helped the city understand things like what's the impact on parks? Where should we be building new schools? What kind of policy decisions should we be making? But they didn't have to get into the weeds of all the data. They're using the insight as a policymaker to look at trade-offs and make investment decisions. The second area is climate resilience for infrastructure. And we heard some of the, the challenges and, um, you know, with extreme weather events, floods, foreca flood forecasting, droughts, fire, erosion. There's all kinds of climate risk that is happening in extreme weather events that are happening at unprecedented rates. So here we've taken all this Earth observation data, imagery data that we have in Google Earth Engine and opened that up to be able to develop climate risk models to understand what are these risks. And then taking those risks and associating them with the built environment. What's the impact to the road network, to the infrastructure of these risks? And these are, you know, huge, large-scale data sets, right? And, and there are people that have expertise in climate science to be able to turn this information into these risk models and then bringing in other data that agencies have, associating that with the built environment. And this, again, is empowering an ecosystem. And the reason I bring this up is that Everyone doesn't need to be a climate scientist or a data scientist. The information and the insight is what's useful. And that's what we're doing, is we're taking all that information and converting that into information that's easier to absorb and use by policymakers and decision makers where you don't have to be an expert in the data. The next example is is one related to the built environment and understanding conditions. So this is in the city of Memphis. So this is one of their public buses. And they have cameras on their public buses. So this is an existing asset that they have. And they wanted to use these cameras to help in a couple different areas. They wanted to understand what are the defects in the road, um, in the pavement conditions, what could be leading to potholes. And they also wanted to understand property conditions and understand whether there was graffiti or boarded up windows or things like that that were happening in neighborhoods. And so we used these, these cameras and these images to develop machine learning models to detect these conditions. And then they used these conditions to feed into their existing maintenance systems, to prioritize 
Where should they be focusing their maintenance efforts? So this is an example where they had an existing asset. We turned a set of data that they already had in, from unstructured data to structured data and then fed it into their existing workflows. And you can imagine many different types of assets and conditions that you can apply this type of technology to. The next example I'll give you um, is related to equity. And last week at TRB in Washington, D.C., Dr. Sean Wilson of the Louisiana Department of Tra Transportation facilitated a great session on equity in transportation and really talked about moving from kind of the symbolic to systematic change. And so the way that we've approached this is taking a data-driven approach to equity. And we've created an equity index where we're bringing together different types of data, looking at things like crashes and safety, access to transportation, access to opportunity, impact from climate risk, any of these topics, and then bringing in the layer of data to understand how are different neighborhoods impacted. Those neighborhoods who have been underserved uh, communities of color, rural areas, how are different communities impacted by the investments of the past and where do we need to invest in the future in this moment in time to be able to create more of the opportunities for these neighborhoods that have been left behind. And so this is an area where, again, where we could take a data-driven approach and quantify the impacts, look at how do we address those and then measure the outcome. So these are just a few different examples, and when you think about it, there's the roads and the modes. And we are looking across all of these different areas, and data and analytics can be applied to any of these areas to bring new insights to be able to operate in new ways. So our role in this, the way we think about it, is we are really democratizing the science and technology. So we know it's hard for agencies to hire lots of data scientists and experts. And so we're taking a lot of the complexity out of the technology and making it more accessible so that business users and non-technical people can take advantage of the technology and use it to deliver the insights and make decisions that are faster, easier, and more accessible to many more people within the agency. So last, I'll leave you with this image. So this is a piece of art from Australia. Two artists um, from Brisbane, Australia painted this. And I'd like you to take a look at it and find three observations. So I'll, I'll share my observations with you, and then maybe later we can hear about some of yours. But I'll, I'll first say the obvious is that this is an image of silos. Second, they're beautiful. The artwork is beautiful. Each silo is beautiful. And third, they're, at the top you see something that connects them. That's way at the top and kind of hard to get to. So I'll challenge all of us to think about breaking down the silos, both from a data perspective and an organizational perspective. And think about not just at the top having those silos connect, but how do we build from the ground up those connections? Because that's where we really unleash a lot of the power of and potential, is by breaking down those silos and connecting to the opportunities that exist across the different areas that we all work with. Thank you so much. Thank you, Benali. Uh, one of your points um, drives home to the Department of Transportation is that our mandate is to be data-driven from our planning engineers, to our division engineers, and to the board and it goes down to our RPOs and our MPOs that we must be data-driven. 
Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Kay Meyer. Kay serves as the Director of Industry Consulting for SAS U.S. Government Practice. She assists government organizations with strategies to build data and analytic solutions to drive government transfer, transformation. Please join me in welcoming Kay Meyer. Good morning. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. Thank you to the members of the Board of Transportation and to NCDOT for inviting me to join you today and talk about data and analytics. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to follow Manali and, and to really be able to build upon many of her great insights about analysis and making it accessible and available to everyone. You know, I think sometimes when we think about the idea of analytics, we think about data scientists in some backroom laboratory doing research. But the reality is data and analytics are a part of our everyday lives. Almost every action we take, almost every decision we make is driven by access to data that is unprecedented in today's world. We can look up just about any piece of information we want. It's at the tip of our fingers on our, on our phones. So how many of you have experienced this? You're talking to a family member or a friend about something you're interested in. Maybe it's a type of service, maybe it's a piece of sports equipment or a household item. And the next time you go to your social media feed or you search something on the internet, there's an ad for that very thing right there waiting for you. Maybe some of you have made a major purchase with your credit cards and almost as soon as you swipe that credit card, you get an immediate text or an email asking you to verify that that's a purchase you actually made. That's just two of many, many examples of where behind the scenes, analytic algorithms are understanding our behavior patterns, our preferences, our interests, and tailoring and adapting our business practices to meet your preferences, to build brand loyalty, to protect your financial assets and identity. And so as we talk about analytics today, we want to think about how it applies in the way that we do our work every day. So Manali mentioned the idea of digital transformation. And digital transformation is a top of mind issue for business and government leaders across the globe. Um, when we look at digital transformation, it's really the process of making data and the insights that the data can bring us more readily available. Our leadership and our citizens alike both demand and deserve access to trusted, reliable, timely information. So digital transformation is the act of bringing that data and the technology to all aspects of our businesses and of our lives. Whether it's being able to optimize or forecast or simulate today's current conditions and what they may look like in the future so we can make long range strategic plans or whether it's automating tedious, repetitive processes so that our current day-to-day -day operations are improved, or maybe it's how we engage with our citizens and our customers so that they are experiencing government and government operations in a new and different way. But what I would argue is that digital transformation is only partially about the data and the technology. As Manali mentioned, a lot of it is about us. It's about our mindset and our culture. It's about our willingness to challenge the status quo. It's about our ability to be curious and to wonder how things could be different from the way they are today. Why do they work the way they work today? What's happening as, as our times are changing and our business problems are becoming more complex? And how do we change and adapt the way we do business to do it differently? And I think one of the most important aspects of that is understanding that the analytic process and the path or the journey to that through that process is a constantly iterative and, ev and evolving process. And sometimes failure is the path to true transformation. So we have to be open to that idea of testing, trying, proving, and improving. So Manali just showed a picture of silos. It's one of the key inhibitors or challenges that we face in our world today when we talk about data and analytics. And that's the fact that our data is often locked away in siloed transaction systems, well-purposed for the reason that we built those transaction systems. 
But as Manali said, what we have to do is really focus on the idea of breaking down those barriers, both between our organizations, our policy, and our data to make improvements. So I want to talk today a little bit about a few examples of where this is having a huge impact in our world today, and then translate that to how that impacts some of our transportation focus areas and initiatives. So I'm sure you are tired of seeing this kind of image on the screen, correct? Um, but I think if the pandemic has taught us anything over the last two years, it's about the importance of timely, trusted, reliable information. We haven't been told conflicting information at any point over the last two years, right? So, uh, what we found in the early stages of the pandemic, as government organizations and private sector businesses were trying to understand, respond, and manage the COVID situation, what we really found was that our data and the access to it and the ability to understand it was severely inhibited. This was because data I'm sorry, disease surveillance systems across the country were highly decentralized and inconsistent. So the ability to get comprehensive insights into where we were seeing outbreaks and surges and peaks of the virus were very difficult to understand. You remember those early days where we were talking about hospital capacity and medical equipment, medical equipment availability. Much of that information was maintained on paper and submitted via emails to centralized organizations. So in those early days, we were spending hours and hours of time manually pulling together information, assessing that information, and turning it into the kind of intelligence that our leaders needed to make the right decisions. If the pandemic has taught us nothing, it was the need to modernize and improve our public health systems. And what we've seen over the last two years is a significant focus and investment on modernizing our public health systems, improving our ability to collect data on a more automated and consistent manner, and to be able to assimilate that data from local, regional, state, and federal levels. Making that data available for quick analy analytic insights. The current surge is a great example. We're so much better able to detect now where the surge is happening, when we expect it to peak, and how many people it can affect. And as we've talked about or heard about this morning, understanding more the impacts to our supply chain, where are vaccines and test kits and the kinds of equipment that we need to treat everyone. And so analytics and this data transformation is changing our public health system to respond to the pandemic. But what that means is that also provides capabilities for our public health system's day-to-day -day operations, for handling the things they've always handled, like foodborne illnesses, like weather-related health issues during national disasters, behavioral health topics, and substance use disorder. So again, data can play a huge role in our health systems. We've also seen the pandemic impact the health and well-being of people individually outside of just the virus. As you know, with many people isolating anxiety and stress, we've seen a significant rise in the opioid and illicit drug crisis increasing numbers of overdoses and deaths um, due to this ongoing crisis. In the state of New Jersey, we saw a unique approach, an innovative approach to breaking down those barriers or those silos that typically exist in our government operations. New Jersey brought together public health officials, law enforcement, first responders, forensic lab technicians, and the Attorney General's office. And by coalescing those individuals and the data that they represent, New Jersey is now able to make the kinds of connections and build the kinds of insights that let them understand how drugs are trafficking into the state, where they're coming from so that they can begin to take efforts to intervene and stop that traffic of drugs. They're able to more quickly identify when a lethal compound of drugs is appearing in one of their communities significantly impacting the number of overdoses and deaths. They're able to better allocate their resources with naloxone and first responder um, efforts. And most importantly, they're able to understand where and how they need treatment systems and services and what is working best with particular segments of the population. So again, data and key intelligence out of that data, changing the way we are addressing an impending crisis 
across all areas of our population. And how many people in here have children somewhere between early childhood and college? Lots of hands going up. There's been no impact to your children over the last two years in the education system, right? This has been one of the biggest impacts from the pandemic. Um, what we've seen is challenges for our kids with school closings, with virtual classrooms, with periods of quarantine. Um, we've seen the impact not just on our students, but also on our academic workforce, our teachers, our administrators, and our staff workers. We're having now to work with education organizations to take a really hard and honest look at how these impacts have affected our students. And, and that effect can be disproportionate for, for populations of color and people who are in typically disadvantaged groups of our population. We're having to now understand who has fallen behind the most, who has been impacted the most, so that as we begin to look at curriculum changes and adaptations, supportive services and programs, what is it we need to be sure that all students are fairly and equitably given the opportunities to catch back up and to achieve their academic potential? At the same time, though, we have to honestly look at what the impacts on our workforce are. Our teachers and our administrators are leaving the, ac the academic environment in droves. And we have to begin to understand what it's going to take to, to train, to recruit, and retain talented teachers and administrators for the future of our education system. Education five years from now may look vastly different from what it looks like today, but data and analytics can help us understand what is happening now and begin to plan and forecast for what may happen in the future. And these are just a few areas where the pandemic has had a significant impact in different areas of our lives and data and analytics are helping us adapt and change accordingly. Long before the pandemic, one of my own personal experiences in um, how data and analytics can transform the way we do business was when I was working with the state of North Carolina. Um, I worked in the state controller's office and led uh, the establishment of a statewide data integration initiative called the North Carolina Government Data Analytics Center. If you remember, back in 2008, North Carolina experienced the tragic murders of two university students, one at Duke University and the president of the student body at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In the investigations of those murders, what was pointed out was that those silos, that image that Manali showed, those silos contributed, in fact, to potentially those murders occurring. Our just, criminal justice and public safety data was isolated and separated in more than 10 major criminal justice systems, all fit for purpose and all doing a great job individually. But when key decision points had to be made for justice-involved individuals, it took multiple logins and multiple systems to understand a person's complete and comprehensive picture. And so North Carolina found that those gaps at times could make us um, uh, have human error and change the decisions we made. And so we spent time pulling all of that information and developing a single consolidated system that operates in the state of North Carolina. It lets, it lets law enforcement, courts, corrections, probation and parole officials all access this single system and understand comprehensively all the information about a justice-involved individual. So when they have to make that very quick often life or death decision about how they're gonna interact with an individual, how they're gonna make a sentencing decision or a supervision decision. They have all the information right there at their fingertips. That information has been assimilated and analyzed and, and key parts of that information can be highlighted for the user. So many, many different ways that analytics is improving our safe, the safety of our communities, making our businesses more efficient, giving our children opportunities and protecting our health. So what does this mean for transportation? There's so many opportunities to apply these same kind of concepts in transportation. Changing dynamics that we've heard about today, climate change, revenue funding changes, uh, how we operate and engage with our stakeholders, our citizens and our, and our vendors, all of those can use data and analytics to change the way that we operate to improve our efficiency, to improve our engagement. So just to talk about a few, 
you know, long before the pandemic, we were already talking about the impacts to revenue funding. As in electric vehicles and hybrids were becoming more and more popular, we began to see an impact on our usual motor, ta motor fuels tax revenue source. And that change is going to only continue to grow with the adoption of electric vehicles and hybrids. But then the pandemic hit and our workforce places changed. They shut down, people began to work remotely. And so now we have a new and changing dynamic that we're dealing with. With analytics, we have the ability to do optimization, simulation, forecasting, and prediction. We can begin to say, what's gonna be the impact on our revenue streams if we have 30% less driving over the next 12 months? And in these days, maybe over the next 24 months or five years, who knows? But with analytics, we can begin to understand what is happening with our revenue today and what it may look like in the future. That allows us to proactively research and understand what new revenue streams may be available to support our infrastructure, infrastructure build and maintenance programs and to further the needs of our infrastructure um, planning. Just like those retailers, we also have the ability to engage with our consumers a little bit more effectively. We use something called computer intelligence or customer segmentation to understand how individuals are interacting with some of our operations. Take our turnpikes and toll roads. That's a, a, consumer, a consumer interaction with us and the citizens that use those facilities. Using analytics, we can begin to understand who is using our toll roads and how are their behaviors of pattern? Are they everyday users? Do they take long trips on our toll roads or very short trips? Who is most likely to get a transponder and automate their pay, the paying of their fees? Who's most likely to not pay their fees even when we mail them a reminder three times? And as my daughter has learned, with a significant uptake in the fee every time that reminder comes. Um, but with the right kinds of analytics, we can begin to understand what are the best ways to reach out, to attract people to use our, our roadways and our toll, toll facilities, and what are the best ways to help them stay current on their, fees, on their fee obligations um, and, and to, reduce the efficient, uh, to reduce the cost of efficiently uh, keeping people from delinquency. And then there's all kinds of new technologies that are constantly evolving. Manali talked about um, the Internet of Things, censored highways, connected vehicles, all sorts of ways to capture data. Here's just a couple of examples of where we're using video technology to begin to understand normal patterns of roadway traffic. We can understand the number of cars and the types of vehicles, how fast they're going. We can understand typical patterns of urban traffic. What happens when we begin to collect this information over time and we have the ability to store that information, we can see what is the normal behavior. Therefore, when something unusual happens, the analytics are able to alert uh, operations immediately. If there's an object in the road, if road conditions change, if traffic suddenly slows or the number of cars suddenly increases, we have the ability to be alerted to that information right away so that we can take action to clear the problem and to return traffic to normal, improving safety and efficiency of our roadways. And also, uh, as similar to an example that Manali spoke about, um, we have the ability to use existing infrastructure that's out there. This is an example of a camera mounted on the front of a locomotive on our train, on our train track system. Again, by capturing information on a regular ongoing basis as the train is moving along our railroad infrastructure, we're able to understand the current status and circumstances of that infrastructure. We're able to quickly detect when there is an anomaly, perhaps there's a needed repair or something is obstructing the tracks. This can improve preventative maintenance, limiting outages, but also improving the safety of those who are using our rail infrastructure. So I've given you a few examples of how, um, how we can use analytics to change the world of transportation, and we're just scratching the surface here. Many of these things affect mobility and the end citizen more, more, uh, more target in a more targeted way, but many of it also affects how we plan for and implement our transportation improvement plan, 
how we build and maintain our infrastructure, how we manage our financial resources. So it's up to each of us to think about in our own worlds, in our own jobs, what is it we need to know? Why is it things work the way they work today? And how is it that we can change them in the future if we have the right access to information and intelligence? So with that, I thank you, and I believe we're going to answer some questions. Thank you, Kay, for your presentation. Before we begin, let's look at the poll results. We should be up here. Okay. All of the above looks like the winner. We have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions. We have five microphones throughout the aisles. Uh, if people would line up and we'd, we'd like to get some questions from the the audience. Uh, but Ali Kay, I'm curious uh, what each of you found most interesting in each of the other's presentation. Well, I thought it was really interesting, um, Manali's focus on the idea of ease of use of analytics. And I, I think that idea of democratizing data and democratizing analytic capability, again, I think so often when we hear, especially the terms big data and analytics, People think it's something for somebody else. Um, they think it's something for those data scientists or the researchers. But the reality is we need to find ways to embed this in our everyday work and our everyday lives. You know, I, I, think about, um, I think about some of the simplest decisions that we make every day. So where am I gonna go out for dinner tonight with my family? Um, nowadays, you check your restaurant, you check who's rated it for what, you look at menus, you look at prices, is there a wait list? Can you get a reservation? What's Waze telling me on how long it's going to take to get there? We do this in our everyday lives. We use all the data that's available to make these kinds of everyday decisions. We need to really change that, I think, and build that into our working environment as well. And I think Manali made a great point in, in talking about how to make that easier to use for people. Yeah, there's so many interesting things that you shared. Um, a couple things that really stood out to me is like that that example you gave of, um, you know, with the, the deaths that took place and, and the silos that prevented that detection. Or, and, and that's something that I think is, is such a powerful example, right? Where if, if systems and data were connected, it actually can help people do their jobs, right? All these people have good intentions of trying to do what they are supposed to do, but sometimes the obstacles are the fact that they're not able to get to the insights that they need. And so that was just a really compelling example. And the more that we can break down those silos and be able to bring together information and just serve it up to the people who are, who are trying to make decisions in a way that makes it easier for them to do their jobs. And I think that's, you know, as I think about that, you know, sometimes when we get into this world of like, you know, AI and machine learning, people think, oh, it's like gonna take away people's jobs. But actually, that's not the goal, right? It's really about making people's jobs easier. And we know that, you know, that people are being asked to do more, right? With, you know, same, same resources or less resources in being asked to do more. And so I think being able to enable people to take out a lot of those manual steps that are often the painful things and really focusing on the decisions and the actions that they could take, that really stood out to me. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Bill Rice. Um, my company is Rice LLC Planning and Environmental. Um, as a planner uh, and somebody who works in the environmental arena, uh, data and analytics over the past, even the last five years, has really changed the nature of the way I do business. Oftentimes, we can make judgment calls or impact uh, calls um, using a lot of data or even a number of sets of data. But there's a term that, uh, you guys might hate me for this, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but there's a term that comes to mind from back in the 80s was garbage in, garbage out, GIGO. And so there's always that thought of how reliable is this data and what has been used to, to truth this data to, to say that it's the purest data possible for its use. You know, could you guys talk about QAQC in this line of work and, and how your companies do that? 
K, Anal analytics. Absolutely. And you are absolutely right. That, that term still exists, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, we can only rely on our data if it's reliable and trusted. So I think before you can actually get to the aspect of doing analysis and trying to gain insights, the first thing you have to do is have a strong data management strategy. Uh, when we were building that criminal justice system in the state of North Carolina, you know, what we found was the quality of our data sources across different systems varied greatly. Um, you know, we have 96 jails across our, across our state, and each jail runs its own jail management system. So the, the data and the quality of that data really varied from jail to jail. So I think one of the first things you have to do is be sure that you send your data through a really strong data quality assessment where you profile that data, where you validate definitions are standard and mean the same thing across your various silos of information, where you test out um, uh, anomalies in the data, you know, looking at things like values that make no sense, fields that should be in one format and are in a different field, missing information. And so you've got to build the process to validate that. Um, and once you do that, you have the ability to then automate that data management and data quality review and profiling process. We've also found that as we begin to use our data in new ways, when we begin to pull it out of transaction systems and seek to use it for analysis, you begin to see the problems in your data in a much clearer light than you see in one-on-one -on -one transactions. So over time, you can go back then and adjust your data collection processes which over time continues to improve that information. And then I think it's equally as important that you use your models to validate the content and quality of your data sources. Where your analyses point out things that just don't make sense, I think you have to go back to the basics and relook at your data. But that's one of the things I think we're trying to do because right now I think people spend 80% of their time data wrangling and 10% or 15 or 20% of their time trying to understand what the data tells them. We want to flip that model to where we're spending much more time on analysis and we have our data quality and data standardization processes more automated. Yeah, and maybe just to build on that, um, you know, after doing some of that work, I mean, you look at the tools that exist now, um, it's amazing to see, like, it could actually, like, identify for you what are some of the variables that are most significant? Without you doing anything, bringing all that in and starting to like look for some of those patterns. And what are the things that maybe you thought were significant that are actually not that significant? And you know, as we think about using things like machine learning, you know, it's doing that training of these models where we use after the data is cleansed, it's brought in, then we're doing this training on data and looking at are we able to use these models to predict the outcome. And there's ways to do that now that are so much easier, right? And, and by clicking buttons and, you know, using these tools, you can do this in a much less costly and faster way. And so I think it helps take some of that risk out of like, oh, this is going to be a big monolithic system that I'm, you know, and what's coming in, you know, assessing all this data is very time consuming and, and as you mentioned, the wrangling. If you could do that a lot faster, right, you can bring in more sources of data and evaluate them more quickly and determine which things are the garbage and which things are useful. Well, Manali, what has your experience been with other state departments of transportation and their um, management of data? Yeah, I've seen, you know, it's interesting, different agencies approach this kind of digital transformation in different ways. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, we've worked with Colorado Department of Transportation and the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. And Colorado took an approach of saying, they have a, a chief data officer and they said, you know, we really want to build an advanced analytics platform, break down all those silos, and so they really started from this foundational level and looking across all their different systems, their different areas, traffic operations, safety, maintenance, and we helped them develop an analytics platform that brought together data that fell into these different silos and brought it together to address many different use cases from things like secondary crash analysis, 
traffic analysis, maintenance, and they took that approach of, uh, you know, taking this kind of bigger vision and a foundational data analytics platform. Then um, Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, they started, they had a small team, nimble team, um, and you can, if you want to hear um, Chris Lambert, he's spoken on this from Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. Um, they started from the perspective of kind of cost savings in infrastructure, in IT infrastructure. They basically started with the use case of snow and ice operations, and they just, they didn't have enough room to, you know, on their on-prem servers to process all this data. And they said, okay, we need to move this to the cloud, and we want to save costs. And then once they did that, they just started cranking out all these different use cases, work zones, incident detection. And it was just phenomenal to see the way that they just kind of took this very scrappy approach with a small team and started cranking out all of these use cases. And so it can happen in these different ways. It could take place at kind of an enterprise level, but it can also start small with a team that's passionate and, you know, kind of willing to kind of lean in into these tools. So it, it can happen in different ways based on the agency. Okay, so SAS is an extremely important corporation in, in the triad, uh, important to the department. What's uh, SAS working on for the department or for the state? So we are, we are a strong partner with analytics here with the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Obviously, this is our home state. We're headquartered here. And so we have a great interest in the business in North Carolina um, and how to make our state the best place it can be for our citizens. Um, I think we're doing a lot of work. And, and similar to um, what Manali just said about having sort of an enterprise vision, I think our Department of Transportation is extremely innovative and has a, a strong enterprise vision for enabling analytic capabilities. Mm -hmm. But they started in a similar way, I think, with small, very targeted um, solution opportunities where they could divine, define clear outcomes. Um, and then they have built over the last four or five years significant expansion in their analytic capabilities. So we're doing a lot of work in cash flow and expenditure modeling, um, helping the department understand um, where revenue is coming in and what projects are on the table and how they can continue to plan and allocate resources to those projects. Um, but we're also doing work with some interesting work with um, DMV and the license and theft division within, DM within DMV. Uh, we're doing road resiliency work that's in, in partnership with NC State University, so a wide variety of things that are taking place here in North Carolina. One question I always have is the velocity and the volume of data that comes so fast. And, and how do you manage that as an institution? Molly? Yeah, I mean, that's where a lot of these tools come in, right? Being able to process and make sense of this data. Um, you know, and if you think about, like, for Google, you know, we have all these applications that have, like, you know, over a billion users. And so there's all kinds of data coming in. And it, the way that these, these applications were built were leveraging cloud computing, and that's what gives the scale and the flexibility. And so for agencies, being able to leverage, you know, this kind of technology now is so much more accessible. So being able to bring in different data sources, combine them together, and then tap into these new sources of data. Like I mentioned, things like, you know, imagery and Google Earth Engine, right? There's all these other sources of data that on, on, and on your own would be really hard to manage all of that. But the, the technology now is one of those enablers that helps you bring in this data and then make sense out of it. So the velocity and the types of data are definitely increasing as we see connected vehicle data. Um, this already exists. So much of this data already exists. So kind of combining agency data with these new sources of data, that's what really helps unlock the, the velocity of the innovation. Hey, and Pat. I have a question, if I may. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, when I came, my name is Ed Driggs. I'm a member of Charlotte City Council. And we are working currently on a, a mobility plan within the region that could cost 12 or $14 billion in the end. It extends about 20 years into the future. My feeling is that the way we have allocated to rail, to uh, roads, to buses, and so on, is pretty unscientific. 
And so I've been pushing for more of a data-driven approach uh, to, to be a little more analytical. But my question really is, what kind of data should we be looking at? We're concerned about issues like autonomous cars or maybe uh, trying to formulate a long-term plan that is adaptable to new technologies as they emerge. But if I had to tell my colleagues, I have a, a quantitative background myself, but if I had to tell them, look, we need more data, uh, how do you translate what you've been telling us into a situation like that and what we should be looking at? Yeah, you know, one of the things so we've been working on is being able to do AI-based scenario planning. So to be able to look at these different um, planning situations and outcomes and be able to do more rapid analysis. And so that could be, you know, some of the examples that I was sharing bringing in, you know, there's kind of the traditional approaches in data, but then looking at what's, what's the impact of climate risks, for example, and bringing in that type of data. And I've had conversations with other agencies, too, who are thinking about, like, you know, 15 years from now, should this road actually be here? Should we be investing in this road and hardening it? It's eroding, it's on the coastline. And thinking about whether that investment or what type of investment actually makes sense, because if we look at the future and, you know, will those communities still be able to even live in, in that space? So be, being able to bring in these new sources of data um, and these new lenses, um, I, I mentioned the kind of the equity analysis too, um, economic development, bringing in these types of data sources and, and as Kay mentioned, even things like revenue projections, being able to bring these things together and combine them and look at different scenarios and different outcomes. And it doesn't mean that we're gonna be able to predict exactly the future, but we'll have a better sense of the parameters and what different scenarios might happen and then how do we make decisions and plan based on those. And I think that's, that's a big opportunity for us. Even now, I would say, I mean, for the future, but even looking at with the infrastructure bill, right? Like, how do we rethink the way we prioritize investments and making those types of decisions and maybe rethink some of the ways that we've done it in the past? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, I think you have a challenging dilemma when you're, when you're trying to forecast five, 10, 15 years out. And our world is changing and evolving in such short time frames these days. But I, I think, you know, as Manali talked about using a wider variety of data sources, I think that becomes key in this, in, in this situation. You know, I think your decisions are gonna be impacted not just by your transportation and your mobility options, but what's your economy gonna look like in the next five to 10 years? What does the workforce look like? So what are our labor and market statistics um, telling us about what the future is, is like in the workforce? And what is your demographics of your, of your regional area? Um, how do you expect you know, people to be moving in and out of your area? Um, what other industries are coming to your, to your region and your area that may impact things? What's the education environment? Um, is it drawing people in or are people leaving your communities to go elsewhere? All kinds of things like that. But one of the things that I think is so interesting about this idea of AI is that it's ever evolving and learning. So I think what you do is you, you take that kind of information and you make the best predictions you can today through simulation, um, through forecasting and predictive models. So you can put parameters on them that say, I expect our workforce to expand somewhere between I don't know, 10 and 25%. I expect my demographics to change these ways. Um, and you beca can begin to do what if scenarios that play out different end results. The interesting thing about AI is, you know, I know a lot of us think about AI and we probably think about what we see in the movies where computers and robots take over. That's not AI. <laughs> what AI really is, is the ability to use these wide variety of data sets and make decisions on how we're going to take action based on the best information we have today. But the real power of AI and machine learning is that as we take action and as we begin to collect the data into the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, we feed that data right back into our data sources and our models. And it begins to understand whether the results we're achieving, the metrics that are showing up, are actually in alignment with what the models and the insights were that were provided at that first step. They can refine then and say, Things aren't happening the way we expected them to happen. Let's reassess and let's take, you know, have this new information so that you can adapt your plan, 
you can change direction slightly, or perhaps it's confirming that exactly what you expected is what's, what was expected, continue on this path. And I think that's the power of a AI and machine learning. I appreciate that. I think a lot of people here will know what I mean when I say your vision uh, and the reality of uh, uh, the processes that we're dealing with, the people that we're dealing with, are, are still in many cases far apart. So I think the most valuable thing you can do is actually try to bridge that gap and, and you know, get to the point where you're telling people, this is what you can do in the next few months. This is the survey you need, this is the data you need to tap into, and that's how that data could help you decide whether you need more buses or whether you're being environmentally friendly or, or racially uh, just. Anyway, I really appreciate uh, your comments and your answers. Thank you. Yeah, I think that point is so valid. Um, I, I think Manali mentioned it earlier, having an enterprise vision and a long range mm -hmm. vision is really important. But you have to start small. You have to take those first incremental steps. And so that point that you just made is so valuable. What is the first thing I can do that allows me to begin to collect better and, and more relevant data? Um, you mentioned earlier, the velocity and volume of data is changing so dramatically. But not all of that data is important. So we have to find ways to use our technology to drill down to what is truly relevant and important to the question we want to ask, to understand how we get to those key pieces of information in a smaller scope with a quick result that we can begin to measure and then grow from. So I think your point is very valid. One of the other factors too that in North Carolina, as the board has to look at things, our population is projected to grow by 20% in the next 10 to 15 years. But we don't know where. We have an idea, but it's hard to pinpoint. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Bentley Sims. I'm with NCDOT with Office of Civil Rights. I'm also an HBCU fellow. Um, one of my questions would be, for, for someone who, who works with data almost all the time, how would you really inspire people to really want to work with data? Because even though you can gain an education from it, it's still a matter of getting people to want to be inspired with wanting to work with data, knowing where that data comes from. And it all sounds interesting, but you also want, I guess what I'm trying to ask is how would you want to bring people in to really want to work with data? And if you are bringing people in, how would you advertise yourself to get into people within minority groups? if that makes any sense. Yeah. I guess the recruitment, um, computer science people, uh, how do we get younger people more interested in data as a profession? I, I think, you know, I was sharing this in the beginning. I, I like to kind of start with like, what is the thing that inspires you in terms of the impact that you want to make in the world, right? Like, and that, I always start with that. Like, what are the things that I care about um, and we each are passionate about different things, right? And using data and kind of understanding it and working it is a means of getting there. And so for me, um, you know, and each person is motivated differently, but for me it's really about what's the thing that I care about making an impact in? And you know, for me, like climate, resilience, equity, safety, those are things that I feel really passionate about and I feel like it are important societal issues. And so the way I was mentioning earlier, the way that like my career path has evolved is I, I, I didn't start off thinking about data and analytics. I was thinking about how do I make an impact with these areas that I care about. And then I tapped into these kind of resources that, you know, from Google and, you know, other places that I've worked at to like, oh, these are ways that we can really like 10x the way we approach these, these challenges. And so for me, it's like these are the tools or the enablers. Like I, I mean, I, I'm a little bit of a data geek, but um, <laughs> more so I'm more like, all right, how do I use these tools to actually help with this outcome? And so um, that's kind of the way I think about it is what inspires you, what sparks you, what gets you energized and, you know, and then tap into the different ways that you can go about doing that, whether it's data analytics or policy work. It could be coming at it from any of these dimensions. Yeah, I think it's an interesting thing. Um, you know, I always believe strongly in storytelling. Um, and so, you know, you can learn something from data and you can tell people statistically what you learned from the data. But if you can tell them a story about how it's gonna impact them, 
that's going to intrigue them to want to get involved and understand. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, when we were building the integrated criminal justice system, which was one of the state's first big enterprise approaches at integrating data from across a lot of different sources and analyzing it in a different way, um, you know, there was a lot of skepticism. This is a big project. I'm not sure it's going to really work the way you think it's going to work. And, um, and so one of the very first things we did was a very, very small scope where we combined just corrections and court information, uh, not the other ten, not the other eight or nine sources of data, just those two, and we began to present it to law enforcement. One of our law enforcement agencies that were, were the first people to view the prototype of the system actually looked up one of their offenders. They had been doing surveillance on him for weeks and couldn't find him. And in our system, it showed that he had a traffic court date in the next county in the next week. They sent two officers to sit in the court, and when that man walked in, they arrested him. And this was after hours and hours of trying to surveil this individual. So saving time and money and resolving that issue, they began to talk about, oh my goodness, you can't believe what this system can do. And it only has two data sources right now. That took off and, and really began to change the way people saw what this system was going to have the ability to do for them. And so they wanted to engage. They wanted to provide data and give us advice and guidance on how the, the system should work and what it needed to tell them. And so I think sometimes it's about achieving a small outcome and then telling people about it, telling the story and letting them understand how this can impact their day-to-day -day work. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Kevin Lacey and CDOT. One of the things that we both talked about is the, uh, the rapid growth of data, the analytics, the use of it. But uh, what we're also seeing is a uh, tremendous amount of growth of misinformation using the same data sources that we trust or have trust in. And uh, what is your recommendation to uh, states, DOTs, other government agencies on dealing with managing misinformation because we deal with that on a, I, I, I'm an old school data geek myself and I've been dealing with it for 25 years, but it's becoming more relevant, uh, more, you know, it's, it's almost a daily task now dealing with misinformation. And that's just in our area and, I, and you can pick any other part of our society and fill this room up with misinformation. So how do you guys recommend dealing with that? Yeah, I can share an example. This is definitely a, a big challenge. Um, you know, during during the pandemic, um, one of the things that we did, we worked with the, the state of New York where um, they were, there's, you know, all kinds of misinformation out there, right, um, related to the vaccine. And so um, we worked with the state to leverage, like, Google search trends and look at what are people searching on. And that was a cue to what some of those kind of um, areas of misinformation were. And so what they did is then the state looked at these trends and as, you know, as something was emerging and you see more and more people searching on um, a particular topic, they would then take that information and use that um, to proactively address these things that were kind of circulating and, and that were on people's mind. And, and so, you know, the public health officials and the um, governor would come out and actually proactively message around these things that were kind of emerging. And so that's just one example of being able to use this kind of um, information to understand where are people's heads and, and what's happening. And we call that more broadly, we call it sentiment analytics and being able to understand what are people's attitudes or um, towards different topics and, and using that as a signal to be able to proactively address some of the misinformation. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Debbie Bride. Uh, I'm with the North Carolina Department of Transportation, uh, HBCU fellow as well. Um, I had a couple, I had a question um, regarding supply chain. Um, I was wondering if you guys have any uh, GIS systems or any like in analytical tools to help um, with supply chain. I know it's, it's, um, it's up in the air kind of right now, you know, as far as what we physically can do, but as far as to help, um, you know, 
sort of research and try to help figure out, you know, what's the best modes uh, for, you know, uh, getting stuff in and out of North Carolina or, you know, just in, in anything in general like that. Trends in intermodal? Absolutely. You know, geospatial data is, it, I mean, it, it's so important in so many different aspects. Um, one, understanding, you know, it, we can be, be able to use it to understand, um, you know, how, how goods and services are, are, are operating in the state, moving through the state. Um, it allows us to really map the most optimal route to, to move things along. I think there's a lot of things that are impacting supply chain besides geospatial data right now, obviously, um, you know, with the global pandemic and the right. limitations. But uh, we see geospatial helping us understand things like um, uh, topography, um, potential impacts during uh, weather events that may impact the movement of, of goods and services across the state. Um, so geospatial and, and integration with like ESRI type of capabilities with analytic systems, um, it's becoming really a very, very seamless integration um, perspective in terms of helping us understand um, you know, what data is coming in, how it could impact the, the way things are moving through our state. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add a couple things to that. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work we do is very much in the realm of geospatial and being able to bring data, easily visualize it is built into a lot of the, of the tools. Um, the other thing we've done is work with partners like um, you might have seen Cardo up there. Um, so they're a platform, a geospatial platform that brings together data, leverages the power of um, cloud capability so you're not limited with how much data, but then creates really beautiful and easy to use visualizations, dashboards, tools. And part of it, um, as I mentioned earlier, is like we don't want these tools to be just for people who are GIS experts. And that's the, the power of some of these new tools that are, are coming out there, like the Cardo platform, is that it's not just for a GIS expert. GIS experts can use them, but business users can use them, and they're easy to use. You don't have to be an expert. So, you know, I would encourage you to kind of check some of those things out as well, because I think that's a part of this, is, as we talked about, is making it easier for lots more users rather than just the experts in GIS. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Kay and Ollie. Appreciate it. Uh, on a personal point, uh, we, you were talking about the DMV. Uh, I'd like to introduce our new DMV Commissioner, Wayne Goodwin. I've known Wayne for 30 years. Uh, I worked with him when he was at the, uh, when he was uh, Commissioner of Insurance, we worked together on several important topics for the state and for the insurance industry. And uh, Wayne will bring some good uh, experience from insurance and into the DMV. Uh, let's, them, let's give them both another hand, thank you. As we get ready for lunch, please attend the breakout sessions that happen right after lunch. If you have not downloaded the app, please download the app. The breakout sessions will begin at 1.30. Please visit our vendors, visit the Office of Civil Rights, Business Development Zone on the trade floor, and please wear your masks. And thank you for attending the first general session. <laughs>